What's on Titan? <coughs> <coughs> Titan is an extremely uh, interesting place. Uh, um, organic matter, the stuff of life, yeah. is falling from the skies of Titan like manna from heaven. There's so much of it that we can't see through to the surface of Titan. It's, it's socked in. <coughs> and recently, um, um, Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based radar data have begun to fill in our information on the nature of the surface, but a key question is still unresolved, whether there are oceans of liquid hydrocarbons on the surface, uh, and we don't yet know the answer to that. But isn't it astonishing? If you want to know something about the chemistry of the origin of life, go to the big moon of Saturn, who would have figured that that's where we can learn about our own origins? And yet, that's the way it now looks. But that's uh, that's next door in terms of, in, in universal terms. Oh, ab Titan's ab just ab down the street from uh, here. Uh, absolutely, although it's... And you're that close, and there's the other possibility of origins of life. Oh, oh no, no, no question. So then multiply that by all those hundreds of billions of other planets, and uh, you have some hint of what else may be possible. No diamonds on Mars, though, eh? Well, there has been a serious... Uh, <laughs> you know, you've read this book very carefully, <laughs> I must say. Uh, there has been a suggestion in the scientific literature that uh, there may be lots of diamonds on Mars, but it is a mere suggestion, and I would not think it would justify a program of exploration of Mars by itself. Uh, there but are you pl think plenty there is, of other we reasons. should have, we should explore well, Mars. Absolutely, a world of wonders. And uh, speaking about uh, the origin of life, Despite the fact that Mars is uh, arid and frozen and desolate today, as far as we know, four billion years ago, it was warm and wet. There were rivers, there were lakes, there may even have been oceans. Now, four billion years ago is a very important time for our planet. That's the time of the origin of life. And so, isn't it possible that on the next door planet, when conditions were very similar to what they were here, life arose there also? And if so, is that life still hanging on in refugia, uh, oases somewhere on Mars? Or is it extinct and awaiting uh, the search for chemical and morphological fossils? Uh, the possibilities are extremely exciting uh, about Mars as well. as well. What do I look like from Mars? A parasite? Uh, you are part of an extremely thin film of life that but, but covers you, the do surface. Do your resolution to within one meter act with the... With the, with the, with okay, the well, we well, well... see that the Earth is a pale blue dot, and I'm a parasite and my car is a dominant <laughs> creature. <laughs> From Mars, um, even with a large telescope, uh, you see continents and oceans and clouds, maybe mountains and rivers. You certainly do not see life. If we were to improve our resolution, our ability to see fine detail, um, it is only when we get uh, to uh, 100 meter and better resolution that even the artifacts of our civilization become apparent. Even the sky dome? Uh, yes. And it's not just a question of being able to resolve it, but does it have contrast with its surroundings? Because if the contrast yeah. is poor, you can't see it anyway. And what, what I'm describing is the result of uh, satellite and space probe uh, investigations of the Earth. Yeah, there was one you'd had them turn around and take a l quick little snapshot. Yeah. I'll, come, I'll, I'll, come to that. I'll come to that. <laughs> a little click, and then off it time. goes forever. But humans, to, to see humans, you would have to be down to better than a, a meter resolution, which is, uh, we don't have many pictures of that sort. We are not, and even our artifacts are not very detectable. The title of the book, Pale Blue Dot, comes from the fact that the Voyager spacecraft whipped through the solar system, opened up the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune systems for us, and are now on their way to the stars after they pass Neptune. Uh, it was, it seemed to me, such a good idea to turn the cameras of one of the spacecraft back and take a look at the planet that launched it. And we were able to do that, and there was the Earth, a pale blue dot, and it seemed so exquisitely beautiful, vulnerable, fragile, that uh, to me it, it cried out to us to, to care for one another better and to care 
for this planet, which after all is the only home we've ever had. It spoke to me in a very spiritual way. What about all those asteroids that are whizzing around? And I, I'm, I'm not a betting man, but if I'm going to stick around for a couple of million years, one of those things is going to bop me, isn't oh, it? Oh, you're absolutely right. Bob. Bopping is in the cards. The Earth lives in a bad neighborhood, um, and uh, we orbit the sun ad- amidst a uh, horde, a crowd of uh, asteroids and comets, and every now and then the Earth runs into one of them, or one of them runs into the Earth. And uh, the little ones cause little damage. The big ones cause big damage. 65 million years ago, a big one hit the Earth and is the, the presumptive, almost certain, cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Yeah, you're absolutely convinced of that. I well, think the evidence is now very clear, yeah. not just the dinosaurs, but 75% of the other species of life on Earth. And uh, that is as clear a reminder as, you, as we need yeah. that we have to pay attention. And a much smaller uh, asteroid than than the one that knocked off the dinosaurs, can destroy our vulnerable global civilization. So we have to at least inventory these objects. Let's see if any of them is going to hit us in the comparatively near future. We're not even doing that. You picked up anything from on the, the, the intergalactic radio network lately? You are involved in a project that tries to receive radio signals from across. Yes, that's right. Is there that's any, are you hearing anything? Not, not uh, intergalactic, but interstellar. Interstellar stars, 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 stars uh, in our own galaxy. Are there, surrounding any of those stars, a planet on which an advanced civilization with radio technology is broadcasting to us? That's, that's the question. And uh, while we have found some enigmatic um, findings, none of them repeats. And uh, repeatability is absolutely central to believability in science. But it may, is, that, is that possibly a failure of our brain, do you think, a shortcoming of no, your I intelligence just, just and mine? I need repetition to convince me that... No, 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 I think this is a, a realization of human fallibility. We are, uh, we are very uh, able to uh, deceive ourselves on matters of great import and therefore uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, A commonplace claim, non-controversial, your the the level of evidence needed is not as impressive. So we found um, events uh, that match all of our criteria for extraterrestrial intelligence. They're not on the Earth, they're strong, they're narrow band, they, a lot of characteristics, but not a one of them repeats, not, not uh, five minutes later, not five years later. And that being the case, we cannot claim to have found it. Uh, other search programs have, have uh, found similar enigmatic signals. But we are just at the earliest stages of the, of the search. The technology is getting better and cheaper, and we're going to have a very serious search for extraterrestrial intelligence in the next few decades. Thank you so much. Carl Sagan is the author most recently of Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space. It's published by Random House. I'm Peter Zosky. You're listening to Morningside on CBC Radio.